be meeting with you all tonight. Um, my name is Amy Miller, uh, and I have been um, teaching at Fleischer for quite some time now. I really, I love working with watercolor, and um, I've been really excited about the opportunity to um, meet with people this way because um, we get to try like different formats and different kinds of experiments and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, showing you some techniques this evening that is sort of like a little bit of a sampling of what you might uh, learn about in um, the uh, experimental watercolor class that is often, uh, uh, it's often um, offered uh, as uh, uh, an online class. So, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna uh, be really busy this evening. Um, it's probably gonna go by really fast, um, but uh, I can't wait to show you guys everything. Um, and uh, did you um, want to start the video, Vito, or do you think more information or anything like that? We could start. Yeah, I can spotlight your demo video. Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, just briefly to tell you guys uh, what we're going to be focusing on. I don't know if you can see my closet behind us, but I thought I'd take advantage of the fact that um, I, I have a lot of um, interest in pattern in my life. And uh, since we are doing watercolor experiments, I thought it would be kind of a fun sort of play for the evening. So um, we're going to be focusing on uh, a repeat pattern. And um, yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, okay, great. Um, so tonight, you guys, uh, what we're going to focus on is um, I had like all these different types of um, vintage fabrics and I was feeling really ambitious. So I was like, oh, I can show them how to do all of these things. Like I can show them how to do three different patterns. And then when it came down to it, I was really like, oh, there's, you know, it's a very short demo. So uh, I should probably just focus on one and do a really good job with that one. So um, what we have here tonight, this is a uh, classic animal print, um, uh, the leopard, as you know. Uh, uh, as it turns out, this one is not a vintage um, print, but it's I feel like it's very um, classic in style. This is actually a Kate Spade dress, um, truth. But um, I did really like how graphic it was. And I think it's gonna uh, read really well in watercolor. Um, so what we're going to be doing with this pattern is we're just using this as an inspiration to explore lots of different techniques. Um, so what I'm going to be showing you this evening is I'm gonna be showing you how to do a three layer process. Um, and we are going to be using uh, wet washes um, that it's like um, dropping color into wet washes. We're gonna be doing some uh, techniques that uh, involves uh, spraying um, with like a little spray bottle. And then um, I'm also going to be exploring uh, different kinds of brushwork with you this evening. Um, and all of it is going to be layering uh, wet layers on top of dry layers. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get started. So we're going to just tuck this to the side because it's going to be our little inspirational source. Um, but also, you know, I want to have plenty of room for, um, for us to be able to look at, at what we're painting. So, um, so the materials that I'm going to be using this evening um, are going to be um, a, um, a, first of all, the paper that I'm using is going to be a, uh, um, it's a Artistico uh, Fabriano uh, cold press watercolor paper. And it is 140 pounds, um, especially when you're working wet into wet. Um, you want to make sure that you're uh, using at 140 pound paper, if not um, 300 pounds, um, if you are feeling fancy. Because um, the thinner papers, like a 90 pound watercolor paper, for instance, or a mixed media watercolor paper, um, those don't work as well. Like you can try out the wet into wet techniques for sure but you'll see that it doesn't really absorb as much. Also, this paper is 100% cotton, which comes in handy when you're working with wet into wet because it's a lot more absorbent. Um, and then, uh, as you notice, I have it taped down to this uh, board. Um, this is a corrugated plastic board. Um, you'll see them a lot for signs and things like that, but I also buy them in sheets 
um, at the um, art supply store. I know that they carry them at Flick Art Supplies. Um, and also, I believe, um, I don't know if Artists and Craftsmen is open again, but they did carry it there as well. Um, but I'm sure you could also order it online if you look for corrugated, um, corrugated plastic. It works really well, but you could also just tape it to um, like a masonite board or a drawing board if you wanted to, um, or even like a thin plywood board would work also. Um, but it's really important that you tape it on all edges um, so that when you get it wet, the paper, it's gonna wanna warp and stuff like that. And you wanna make sure that it is, um, that it is staying um, stretched. Um, so- um, Quick question, Amy. Yeah. A uh, question from Rosa. Um, can you explain what wet on wet means in, in watercolor terminology? Yes, absolutely. Um, so a wet on wet technique basically means that it is um, something where you are putting something wet onto the paper surface and then, and it could be just water if you wanted it to be. Or you could also do a like water with like any color of pigment, you know, like you could do a, a wash of a color and that would be a wet, um, that would be like a wet layer that you're putting down. And then if you add something else to that, that is also a wet um, medium, like the paint is also wet, then you are, have, you have a wet surface to begin with on your paper and then you're adding more wet paint to that wash. So that's before letting the original surface dry, you're actually going right into it and doing correct. that on wet. Um, and the question then is, is that done before taping it to the hard surface? And I'm imagining it, it's done after, while you're working, right? Correct. The first thing that you're gonna do for this process is you want to get your paper, and um, make sure that it's a little bit smaller than whatever board you're taping it to. And the tape that you wanna use there, you have two options. You have um, the blue painter's tape if you want. Should we spotlight the video again or? Um, I actually think the vi your v demo video went offline. Okay. So... I can't find it in the... I'm seeing you and I'm seeing me on my phone. So that's really bizarre. In the part. Oh, there it is. Just found it. Okay, cool. Here we Great. go. Okay, good. Um, so I'll just adjust it again because I was messing with it a little bit. Um, it likes to flip is the problem. So, okay. Um, Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so I'll shift everything kind of slightly just so we can see things better. Um, so with the video, uh, with the with the paper. So basically, you're going to have your paper first, and you're going to take either a blue painter's tape, um, or you can also use artist tape to tape your edges. Um, but it's important that you tape it first when the paper is dry, um, and then once you tape those edges. Um, then you're ready to start with the wet into wet technique. Um, the actual um, brushes that I'm going to be using today, um, I have a couple different brushes. I have uh, one that is a flat brush um, that is a half inch brush. Um, all of these are watercolor brushes. Um, this one, to be honest, I think I've had for 20 years. It's a synthetic brush. So it holds up really good, um, but it's a watercolor brush that is from, I think I originally got it from Utrecht. Um, I also have uh, two round brushes that I'll be using today um, that are, um, because they're watercolor brushes, you can see there's like a, a really fine tip on it usually, and then the heel of the brush is wider. Um, and that this one is a number 12 round, and this one is a number eight round, um, and they are both uh, Princeton, brushes. Um, but I, it is really helpful to make sure that it is a watercolor brush that you're using because it'll have like sort of like a little bit of a springiness to the bristles. Um, but then the actual like it'll still like it'll absorb it really well. Um, and it like if you use like a brush that's too tough, it doesn't absorb the paint. Um, 
the paints that I'm going to be using um, are going to be a combination of Holbein watercolor paints and uh, Winsor and Newton uh, watercolor. Um, the important thing when you are picking out watercolor, it's really good to um, invest just a little bit of money at first into um, artist quality paints because the pigments are pure and much richer. Whereas if you do buy the cheaper kind of paints that you find in sets like student grade and stuff like that, um, they don't have the same intensity. Um, if you are using those paints, they still work. But if you're ever like, why am I not getting the same results with these? It's probably because there's a lot of like synthetic blending and uh, binders and there isn't as much pure pigment in those items. And usually you'll be buying a box of paint for the same, like that has like 12 colors for the same price you would be paying for two colors if you were doing like the tubes of paint. But you know, just a few colors to start is all you need. Um, and you can always build your colors over time. Um, I'm also going to be using a natural sea sponge this evening. Um, to wet the paper a little bit and for some sort of texturing and things like that. Um, and then I also have this little uh, spray bottle that I mix some pigment into that I will be using at some point. Um, you could just as easily get a spray bottle like from the beauty supply stores or a travel section at the drugstore. We'll have these small little spray bottles and they come in handy if you want to do any spray techniques. Um, because you don't have to fill a giant um, spray bottle with um, with your pigment. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead. Big question, Amy. Sorry. Um, you named two brands of watercolor. What was the second one? There was Windsor Newton and Holbein. It's Can you spell that? H O L B I E N. Thank I you. I also often use Daniel Smith colors. Um, I just don't think I'm using Daniel Smith colors this evening, but I, I like all brands. I like them all. I like all the colors. So I just look at the ones that are, I like the colors a lot, and kind of mix and match myself. But they're all, they're all like good quality. Those are quality paints. Um, so if anybody, unless there's more questions, I'm gonna start the demo. Is everybody good? Okay, great. Um, so what I'm gonna do for this first layer is I'm gonna show you all a wet into wet technique. Um, I am uh, propping my paper ever so slightly with the, um, this tape, um, this roll of tape underneath or any object that you have on your desk will work. But basically I am making the, like instead of having the paper flat right now, I have it at like a very small um, slope so that as I get this wet and I'm working with the pigments, it's going to, uh, gravity is gonna allow the pigments to kind of flow naturally down the page. Um, the colors that I'm gonna be using for this first layer, I'm gonna be doing a layer that is going to be um, this lightest value on the leopard print. Um, and I'll show you what it's gonna look like when it's done. Um, I did do some prep ahead of time because we don't have a really a lot of time for drying. The wet into wet techniques definitely takes time to dry in between layers. Um, so I kind of prepped it in stages to make it go faster. So our first layer is going to look something like this when it's done. This is um, basically what, it, what we're going to focus on for this first layer is getting just some like natural sort of spotting. Um, that kind of follows this pattern that is like kind of at a unnatural, like it's like at an irregular sort of diagonal. Um, and it also kind of lines up, if you look, it's not like a grid, but it also, it lines up um, vertically and it also lines up at a diagonal kind of in the pattern. So if you look at the marks that I made, I kind of was working on that diagonal and also some natural groupings that are kind of more vertical. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and the, um, show you some color swatches to start with, just to give you a sense. Um, so the colors that I'm working with to create that first wash um, is um, it's a combination of two colors. Um, I did a sample of a couple of browns that I have. Uh, this is imidazolene uh, brown, which it has a very transparent quality, but it's like kind of more like a reddish pink. Um, and then uh, burnt sienna. The burnt sienna 
has um, a slight orange cast to it. Um, and I felt like neither of those was exactly what I wanted, but by combining the two colors, you can kind of get a little bit more of a natural sort of appearance because this print is trying to mimic a natural pattern, you know, so it's not just like one color. It's like, has some subtleties to it. Um, this is what the color would look like if it was um, just like diluted with a tiny bit of water. And this is if you drop that color into a wet wash. Um, and then uh, once I mix those two colors together, I also am gonna add just like the tiniest hint of cobalt blue to that mixture. And I already have all three colors prepped here in my mixing surface for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take clean water um, and a damp sponge. And just to show you, um, I have my clean water. I'm putting the um, natural sea sponge in there and then I'm just sort of wringing it out so it's not dripping. Um, it's just kind of damp. And then I'm gonna very gently sort of, oh, um, go over that surface to s gently, I'm not fully soaking it, but I'm just like getting a, just a little bit wet to start. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my round brush and I'm going to um, add a couple areas that are gonna be a little bit wetter than the rest. And if I hold it up to the camera, I don't know if you can, I'm trying to see, do you, can you see how the areas that I wet are a little bit more shiny? Yes, so this, yes. So Area. But are you putting color into it or just water? This is just water so far. Okay. So this that I'm pointing at is damp from the sponge, but this area is very wet. It's like very wet pools of water right now down mm -hmm. there. So once I have that, then what I can do is I can start to drop some color in. Um, if you look at my palette over here, I'm just going to shift a little bit so you can see it more clearly. Um, if you look at my palette, I have my two different shades of brown. And I'm sort of mixing them together to kind of form a um, sort of something in between those two colors. Um, and when it's that pure color, it's going to be very bright. Um, and then if I want to cool it off a little bit, I can just add the tiniest bit of that cobalt blue to sort of neutralize it. So you can see on the one side, it's very bright. And on this side, it's just a little bit less bright. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and start dropping those colors into my sort of wash. And I'm not trying to do like little spots or anything like, you know, like very symmetrical spots. I want them to kind of be irregular shapes and sort of, do you see how it's like, because it's on wet water, it's sort of flowing and absorbing at a different rate. Um, you can even also, if you want to add water to it, this is clear water that I'm also, you can also drop more clear water into that sort of shape to kind of play around and get an interesting sort of diagonal. So I'm starting out with my diagonal across um, and these areas were wet more and this is just the damp paper. So the damp paper is gonna show it, you can see it's holding the shape a little bit more, but you can also add some wet um, water to it if you want to make it a little bit you know, more washed out. Um, so I'm gonna continue wetting different areas on this page. And I'm just playing with the idea of that sort of making some spots, but making them irregular shapes. And then I can even, now I'm gonna add a little bit more of that cobalt so you can see that you can create a little bit of variety within your color for this, like as you drop color into this wet wash. And I'm doing more clear water again and dropping more of that color. And uh, you just wanna keep it really natural and soft. And like in some clusters, you might do like five spots or four spots together and then take a break and do two more spots you know, you kind of just want to make sure that it's following this general idea of a diagonal and a vertical, but that nothing is too symmetrical because um, the spots that are the leopard print are also going to have that same kind of vibe. And I'm just dropping more kind of color into there. 
And I can even sort of play with, in some spots, adding more of the imidazole brown or more of that leopard. And you can also move it around if you want to sort of kind of make it continue to flow. Okay, um, so once you get your sort of wet into wet wash at a place where you're happy with it, um, then at this point, do you see how the paper's like really warped and everything like that? Um, that is like, it's very wet right now. Um, the marks themselves, I'm not blotting them at all because the more um, that I leave that wet surface, the more that it's going to have like kind of like a natural sort of flowy kind of feel to it. And I, I could even go into a few areas if I have anywhere in there that I wanna drop a little bit more color here and there to add a little bit of variety. You can, variety is definitely good in this situation. Um, but at this point, I would just let this uh, wet into wet wash dry a little bit. Um, well, fully dry actually before going on to the next stage. Um, did you have any questions about this, um, this beginning layer? No? Okay, great. So I'm gonna go on to our next layer. So when it's dry, it's gonna look something like this. Um, and uh, you can kind of, just for comparison's sake, um, you can see the value is going to change a little bit with watercolor as it dries. Um, some of the intensity of the color it is going to dry a little bit lighter than whatever you used before. So keep that in mind when you're doing your layers. Um, the next phase that we're gonna do for this, um, for this print is you can see with this leopard print how there's that like sort of gray area in there where it's like a grayish brown kind of color. Um, and that's going to be our second layer. And what this is, is it's gonna be a layer that we're gonna be using a spray bottle um, to like kind of make some sprayed marks that has a slightly different texture on top of an, a, a layer that's already dry. Um, in order to make that, um, the color for the spray, um, I did do a couple like sample swatches where I was playing around with mixing different colors until I got a color that I was happy with. Um, and uh, the color that I decided upon is a combination. It's a combination of a Windsor blue green shade, which is a Windsor and Newton um, version of phthalo, basically. It's like a, essentially a phthalo blue green color. Um, and then uh, I also mixed it with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Um, to get like kind of this like grayish brownish um, sort of tint. Once I had done those swatches, um, then I went ahead and in this uh, spray bottle, you definitely want to do this ahead of time when you're doing the prep. You're going to take liquid watercolor and you're going to put it inside of your spray bottle and fill it with a little bit of water and then stir it and you're going to shake it. Like you're going to like put it and like shake it really well. Um, and the more time that you leave to set it up, the better it's gonna turn out because the paint's gonna have more time to melt. So I prepped this um, earlier this afternoon. Um, I can continue to leave it in this spray bottle for a little while. Sometimes the spray bottles will fog over time. So it's good to like kind of rinse it out after you use it, but you can still keep this watercolor in this liquid format for some time. Um, with this like spray technique, it probably is going to take a little bit of time uh, to get used to the way it feels. So I strongly encourage doing a couple swatches. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of those little swatches just to give you a sense of the layering. So, um, so when you look at these swatches, this is that same spray if it's really close to the paper, the surface area. So if I was like this close to it, then it would be something like this. Whereas this spray probably was out more like this, like, you know, an inch of like maybe two inches. And then this was probably much further back, like four inches from the paper. Um, and you can see there is definitely some variety when you're doing that spraying, depending on if you squirt it one time or if you squirt it several times, it, it's gonna change it considerably. Also these kinds of marks, um, 
they tend to be like really wet. So you'll see there's a lot of texture in these marks. Um, also, a lot of that texture is happening because I'm mixing more than one paint um, to make my composition. And they have different qualities. The phthalo color, um, the phthalo blue green is a very staining transparent color. Um, the ultramarine blue is a very um, granulating color, which means it has larger particles. Um, and as, the, as those sort of mingle with each other and the burnt sienna, um, as they dry, they tend to like settle in different ways and it creates like a more textural kind of wash. Um, so, so that's something that I was also sort of wanting to play with with this combination. Um, I think what I'm going to be going for probably is something more like this range for those spots. And um, I'm uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with doing that spraying. Um, I do recommend trying the spraying first on a on, like on scraps of paper just to get like some sort of natural feel for um, what the spray bottle feels like. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead though, and I'm gonna, I already sort of practiced my um, sprays earlier. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start spraying. Um, I'm gonna do some that are more like a little bit like, you know, like where I'm not moving my hand, but then also if you move as you spray, you're gonna create a slightly different effect. So, um, so that's like if you don't move very much, but if I wanted to, I could also do things like that. Um, and I'm just leaving a decent amount of space in between as I go. And I'm just trying to kind of create that feeling of that leopard. Is there, um... Is there kind of a logic or magic to how you are placing your sprays? Um, like so on the page? I'm following that same idea of the diagonal, but then clustering kind of certain areas of emphasis. So you see, it's not just like, I'm not like, shh, shh, like um, because it's a natural pattern, I'm trying to keep it very loose and sort of like some clusters are closer together and some are like, for, like there's like, then I'm leaving some spaces in between. So if you look at this leopard print, do you see how like this area, for instance, is like clustered, but then maybe there's a little more space in some areas. Um, I'm trying to create a similar feeling in that area, like in this study as well. Um, also, another thing is if you feel like some areas, if you wanna do any softening, in the areas, you can also sort of go back in and soften with that damp sponge that we were using earlier, if there's any areas that you kind of feel like you don't want to be as dark, um, you can kind of soften a few of those edges too, or if you want some of them to be more like distinct patterns, you can also do that. So that's also an option to sort of like play around with that sort of that second layer, because there is like, if you look in the pattern, um, there is like some variety within it where it might be darker a little bit and then get lighter and sort of there's like this like little play that is happening between the two. Does that seem pretty make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Great. So once I'm happy with this, you know, it's good to not like fuss too much. You know what I mean? Um, and then, um, then I'm just gonna go ahead and set it aside. I will say that this one, um, the wet layer that I did is the second time that I did the wet layer. And then the sprays, it's the second time. And I, the one I'm about to show you, this one is the first one that I did for both. And I have to say, I like them both, but I do feel like because I've already practiced once on this one, for both layers, I feel like on this one, it's like I already am like, I got this. I know what I'm doing. So um, <laughs> practice part, makes perfect. Yeah. Well, or also like you're like the idea of when you're experimenting with something like this is that you are learning as you're going. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to try it, test this theory out and see if it works. And then um, if you try it a couple times, it's probably going to be different each time. And you might be like, you know, you, who knows, you might like the first layer better because you've had less control or, so, you know, there's, there's no really, for me, there's no exact science. 
sometimes, yeah, sometimes the practice, it does help. <laughs> okay, so um, set, I'm just setting aside this other layer so that- It looks so molecular. It's awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and like something like this too, it could be like when you, if you were using something as an inspiration, um, you could even decide you don't need to do all the stages, you know, like I might be happy with something at this stage, but then also the question becomes, do you want to go, do you want to do that next layer or, you know, that's why I like doing multiples too, is because I can kind of sort of play, because this is a more like abstract inspiration of this, whereas once we do that third layer, it's definitely going to be like, oh, I was trying to create this leopard print, you know? Um, uh, you can see the, a lot of the color in here that we were talking about. Remember how I said that it's going to settle out differently because it's like a very wet spray and the, di the different pigments kind of, they sort of separate as they dry a little bit. Um, but this, this layer is very dry right now. Um, so the next stage that we're going to do um, is we're going to be creating some like these actual, like these really bold shapes that are in the pattern. Um, but what I'm going to be doing it with is I'm going to be using a round brush um, and um, I, um, sorry, I, I dropped one on the ground. I'm not sure though which one I'm going to like better. I might like the, this one, but I might also like the number eight brush. So I'm going to test it. Um, I'm going to test it out and see which one I like. I am going to show you, um, but I'm, I'm going to be bad, you guys. I'm going to test it on the paper. Um, I'm not doing any side tests for this one. Um, but um, I'm going to show you some examples of brushwork before we get onto this next layer. Um, so when we're talking about brushwork, um, brushwork can be really exciting for a piece. Um, brushwork can create a lot of energy. Um, and I think that when there's a little bit of variety to the brushwork, it, um, it has like a very, uh, it has a really naturalistic feel. Whereas if you're trying to create something that has um, more solidity and kind of has a more like mechanical feeling, a lot of times you might have less variety in your brush stroke and try to have things be more like symmetrical and things like that. But because we're working with a very natural print like this, I definitely want to explore some of the more spontaneous energetic marks. Um, if you look at some of these marks, you'll see that um, there is a certain amount of variety within sometimes like going from thick to, oh, I'm sorry, from thick to thin. Um, with this one, you see how it's thin here, it gets thicker, it gets thin again. Um, this, there's less variety with it. Also with the actual value within the marks, um, there is, um, there's a little bit more variety in these than there are in these ones. Um, and that, like, sometimes that can do, have to do with how you load your brushes. Um, but there's also other ways that you can do that. Um, another way that you can do that is if you look at this example, I'm just gonna move that real quick. Um, if you look at this example of brushwork, do you see how um, there's more than one color in this, these brush strokes? Um, and there's also more than one value. Like if you look at these um, parts of the brush strokes, there is um, a lot more pigment in the brush stroke. I would say it's probably um, around 80% paint to 20% um, water. Whereas these brush strokes over here, there is a lot of water added to them. Um, so that is a way that you can create um, variety within your brush strokes. In fact, I probably did a very similar technique to what we were doing with the wet into wet, except for where I was dropping color, all except now I'm, instead of covering the whole page with a wet wash, I might be doing wet marks that I'm actually feeding um, some of that paint directly into it. You can also play around that way um, with color. Like I could have done it just in this like red violet, but I decided to incorporate also some of this ultramarine blue into that um, as well. Um, so I'm gonna try to do something like that for this leopard print. Like, I don't know how well you can see. I'm gonna hold the pattern up a little bit for everybody. Maybe you can see more. Um, those marks, I really like them. I probably could just do them in a solid black and call it a day. But um, there's a lot of cool subtlety in it where it almost has like the actual mark itself 
it looks like it has like this olive green halo around it and then it's very dark in the center. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to do some really light washes of an olive green, um, maybe even more on the yellow side than an olive green um, because I know that when I mix black with yellow, it turns olive green. So if I drop black into a light wash of like a yellowy green color, I think that it's gonna create that sort of same layered effect. So it's gonna be, this is a test. We're, we're about to find out. I'm experimenting with brush, with brush strokes. Um, Quick question, Amy, before you go on. Um, do we always have to wait until the paper is dry in order to go on to the next layer? Um, there's a lot of different ways to paint and the, there's a lot of techniques where you wouldn't do that. Um, sometimes you might wait for the paper to be damp and then when you go in with your next mark, it'll kind of hold a little bit, but it will also soften. Um, there's numerous, there are, are numerous combinations for how you apply paint with watercolor and probably most mediums. Um, when, um, when I'm working with uh, watercolor, I like to think in terms of wet into wet techniques, which was that first layer that we tried. Um, uh, dry on wet is a technique um, that we are not trying dry brush strokes right now. Um, but just to show you what a dry brush stroke might look like, this would be a dry brush stroke here. Like you can see where it's like kind of scratchy, you know, that, and like it could be a layer underneath that's a color that you're doing those dry marks over, or it could just be the, um, the actual white of the paper. Um, there is techniques where you can do um, dry on wet, where it'll kind of like swim around a little bit. Um, and then um, there, there's also dry on dry kind of marks. So the marks that we're doing today to create this kind of effect, I'm specifically choosing whatever layer I do to the next layer to be dry when I start again, because I don't want it to bleed. Um, but if I did want some bleeding, kind of softer effects, I might um, continue adding to things when they are entirely dry. So in, in that case, um, if you're leaving it a little damp, there's less contrast? Yes, correct. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions before we get into brush strokes? Um, yes. Can you explain how you measure your paints to go into your spray bottle? That's kind of taking us back a little bit. Sure. Um, when we're doing, when I'm doing the spray, like when I am doing the sprays, um, usually what I do is I just take an empty bottle and I feel like you kind of have to play it by ear. It helps to sort of test your colors first with a brush, like small amounts of pigment on your palette before you mix it with this, because this is a considerable amount of paint that's in this spray bottle, but I could use it for a really long time. Um, but what I do is I just like kind of put some paint into the bottom when it's in its liquid form, and then I just don't fill it too much. Like I might start out filling it with this much, you know, water, like let's say one finger worth, and then um, mixing it and seeing, and then running a test, you know, like running one of those like little um, spray tests that we were talking about and sort of giving it a chance to dry too because it looks really different the spray bottle I don't know if you noticed it looks really different when it's wet because it's very wet um, but then if I want to add more water it's a lot easier to add more water than it is to add more paint and I just um, like I said you kind of it does take a little bit of time to prep this um, because you have to let the paint like fully melt into the water. So I would definitely plan on at least giving yourself um, like prepping, like if you're prepping these, give yourself at least 10 minutes to like kind of let it set up, if not longer, because if you let it set up longer, it's going to be even more um, like, cohe you know, like more evenly kind of melted into the, um, into the water. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, so for our brush strokes, 
Um, as I said, I'm not, I'm not going to practice ahead of time. I think, I think I got this, uh, because I've done, um, I've done a lot of stuff with brush strokes and I feel pretty confidently about how I'm going to mix this. Um, but if you, if you're new to it, by all means, like try testing it out on a, you know, on a little strip of paper, the same way that I was testing like these different colors and, um, things like that. You can absolutely just take that time to like, just practice on a sheet of paper what you think you're gonna the desired outcome you want for your brush strokes um but i'm just gonna go ahead and like i said i'm gonna be playing with the idea of a lighter layer that is like a yellowy green um can everyone see the palette that over here still yeah kind of yeah mm -hmm. okay. great so with the palette um i have this yellowy green color here um that i had mixed up from before um, and I might even neutralize it ever so slightly. Um, this wash, I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be too heavy. So I'm definitely with my brush, I'm taking water from my paint cup. Like I'm taking this brush and I'm sort of treating it like an eyedropper tool where I'm just like adding water into that so that it's like nice and liquidy. Um, and then I think I want to neutralize it so it's not too bright, um, just ever so slightly. So um, the mixtures that I was using when I was practicing these tones, um, I'm going, uh, I still have in my palette. Um, so a lot of times I'll just keep what I was using before because you never know when you're going to use it again. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, take a little bit from that and then add that to that yellow just to like kind of tone it down just a little bit. Um, this uh, yellow, just so you know, is actually, I lied, I am using some Daniel Smith colors. Um, so this yellow um, is, I know the base is mostly Hansa yellow light, but I did add a few other things just to like kind of change it ever so slightly. But um, essentially it's like a very like lemony, transparent looking yellow to start with. Um, so now I like how neutralized this yellow is. Do you see how it's not so garish? It's like a little bit more kind of naturalistic now. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and um, the other color that I'm going to be using um, in my, uh, it's like kind of tucked off to the side of my palette, but it's essentially, it's a combination of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna that I already mixed in my palette. Um, and um, actually I'm a liar. I am going to show you a swatch test just so you guys can really see. So let me just grab one piece of paper real quick. Who are we kidding? It's good to see tests, right? That's why we're that's why we're here right now. So I'm just gonna set aside that for a moment. Um, so just to show you um, the um, kind of mark that I'm going for with this effect is I'm sort of trying to create a little bit of that um, leopardy sort of feel. Um, and I'm not trying to like make it again. It's like I like you want it to be like sort of more naturalistic where it might be thicker in some places and thinner in other areas. And just remembering you don't want every mark to be the same. You want them all to like have a lot of variety between the marks. Um, so this is my first color and this is very wet right now. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take a really pure mixture of um, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. And I'm just showing you in my palette so you can see I'm taking it from here and um, I'm just using a, a wet brush, but it's like, I'm really fully charging my pigment up with that combination. Basically, I mixed ultramarine blue and burnt sienna with a palette knife in my paint box. And now I always have this like kind of neutral selection. And just to show you how dark it is, it's like, it's very black. It's very, it's very, it's a very rich color. Um, it looks almost as uh, dark as ink even. So if I was to take that black um, that's very rich and dark and go into that wet layer that is already there, the idea is that I'm going to be able to um, create a really dark spot that like near the edges might have a little color variety. Can you all see that? How it's kind of the same way that um, when we were doing the wet into wet techniques on the large sheet of paper, it's essentially a mark that has that same feeling of wet into wet with it. Um, 
I love the way the colors are combining. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it's it's going to change a lot as it dries too. And the more that you leave it kind of flat for something like this, the less opportunity the colors have to mix and the more dramatic it's going to be. Um, so that's my little test for what I'm going to do over here. Um, I'm just going to set that aside and then let's see how it looks on here. So before when we were, when I wanted more movement in the paper, I was saying that it's good to like kind of prop your paper up. Um, but for this technique, since I want it to remain really um, like not to move around very much and to kind of remain more stationary, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, have my paper sort of flat on the table. I can already tell based on that mark that I'm going to need more. So I'm prepping more of that yellowy kind of color. I am really happy with like based on it not being dry yet. I'm really happy with the way it looks. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a bunch of it because now I've tested it and now I know I'm like, oh yeah, that's it. That's the one. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and start playing around with some of these like little shapes. And um, I might pay a little bit more attention now. Um, before I was being a little more spontaneous with the way that I was putting down my marks. Um, but now this is like kind of more of a detail sort of section. So it might be nice to like really make sure that I'm kind of getting some of the feeling of that, um, that leopard print. And now I'm going to go in and I'm going to add that dark to the middle of it. It's like a really rich, beautiful black. So do you guys see how, like, what's happening now with all of this? And I'm probably not going to do this whole page, you know, just because that seems like an awful lot for you guys to, like, watch me do the same exact technique over and over again. I don't know if you can tell, but this is, this, like, these kind of brush strokes, it's, like, going to go not quite as quickly as the, um, like as your um as those other two techniques but i am going to just show you like at least like half of it just so you can see um what's going on with it And then again, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait too long. I'm not gonna like do all of them at once. I'm gonna make sure to drop it in when it's nice and wet. So is this the first time you're doing the uh, the brush technique in this, this specific? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a theory for me, you guys. Like basically, I like to think of these kinds of experiments as sort of you know how the scientific method, how you'll have, you know, you'll have your sort of like idea of what's going to happen, and then um, by testing it, then you can actually sort of decide. How effective it is, you know. Let's see. And um, I can see that definitely it's like it's getting a lot, the yellow is like pretty 
strong. Like, do you see? Um, I don't know if you guys can see, but it's definitely a little bit, like it's definitely neutralizing it quite a bit. So I might even decide um, to go back. Like right now would be a good example of like, it's still wet, but it's not, you know, it's not fully dry like before. You can also feel free to continue adding some of that black in. Like if, if anytime you're like, oh, I'm like not getting enough of a color or something like that, you can always go back in it, like while it's sort of settling, you'll start to be able to see kind of what's, if it needs more, if you need to darken it a little bit. Or if you decide you're like, oh, I don't like that shape or something like that, like feel free to like continue to like go back as you're playing with these patterns and sort of figuring out. You can also, um, we could also try the opposite way, like what would happen, like what would happen if I added the yellow afterwards. Sometimes it's good to kind of get a feeling of like what that's going to be like too, you know? But I'm just gonna do this one last one. Sort of, I might even play around, like if I feed color for this one, you can also like with these kind of techniques, you can, even though I'm mostly flat, you can also play around with the idea of letting the paint sort of flow down. Like you can see, to kind of get a more spontaneous sort of feel. Like this one in particular, you can see it's like this is bleeding into that one to kind of create that sort of feeling. So Amy, we've got about three minutes. And before we go, I was wondering if you could give us like a few tips uh, for how we could experiment with watercolor at home. Like what are good suggestions or, um, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so if you're trying these tech, like if you're trying to like sort of like um, play with like some different ideas um, and you're wanting to experiment more at home, um, I feel like an important thing is to sort of um, give yourself the space to really focus on the simplicity of techniques and then think about how you can build. So um, if you are um, making these experiments, first of all, you can sort of run like little tests for yourself to see like, what does it look like if I mix different paints together and how, how does it work if I'm applying them when they're wet or when they're dry or that kind of thing. Um, but then also- So lots of tests, it seems like. That's, that's a good thing to go by. Yeah, like just doing a bunch of tests at first, just where you're just focusing on one thing. Um, so basically I'm showing you three separate tests that are layered together. Um, but when you first start experimenting, it's good to kind of have a file of like all these different things where like, it's like, oh, I focused on this technique and I just tried to make it absolutely as interesting as I possibly could. You know what I mean? Um, and then once you form these like little building blocks for like, oh, this was like, I was really trying to like play with like, sort of like, you know, like with like, um, how I could make, um, you know, like let's say you were trying to make a color flat, but you wanted to like see how the colors work together and really just focus on um, what would happen, you know, like if I use like a staining pigment and a non-staining pigment or what would happen if I use water or if I don't use water, you know what I mean? Things like that. Um, and then as you sort of develop all these like little tests and um, you can start thinking about ways that you would combine them. Does that sort of, that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, yeah, whatever technique you're trying, um, you also like feel free to like look, it's always nice to like sort of, like it's good to be in this like class environment, but also I, I watch a lot of videos. There's like so many videos online if you were like, oh, I heard that you can mix watercolor paints with shaving cream and make a painting with that. Like you could look up a video and like then be like, oh, I'm gonna try this technique today. You know, that seems totally bizarre. It doesn't seem like something I would do with watercolor. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's the exact definition of experimenting. Put some shaving cream in it. That's amazing. Um, well, it's 7.30. Thank you so much for this amazing demonstration. That was so much fun and you were right, time just flew by. Um, 
So thank you so much, Amy. And watch out for Amy's class in the fall uh, for experimental watercolor. Um, Amy teaches other watercolor classes at Fleischer as well. Um, now she will mostly be teaching them online since she's relocating and no longer will be in Philly, which will totally miss her, but oh, we'll no. still at least have you in, in person <laughs> or, or online virtually. So that's, that's a good thing to hold on to. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, it was great to see so many familiar faces and names as usual. Um, do join us on Thursday night for another uh, demonstration. It will be drawing in color with Michelle Oosterbahn. So uh, do uh, join us for that and you can register on our calendar page on the Fleischer website. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Amy. Um, take care yeah. and thank you for all the thank yous in the chat box. That's great. Um, and uh, stay safe and have a great night. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.